all the things I was writing prescriptions and referrals for high blood sugar, high blood pressure, migraine headaches, joint pain, anxiety and depression, gastrointestinal issues, hormone stuff, all of it. They were very dependent on what we were eating and how we were moving and how we were managing stress. And yet there was no place on my prescription pad for food in any serious way or for movement or for meditation or for any of the things that were the root cause drivers of some of these conditions. And so what I saw was that we'd created a revolving door between primary care and specialists that was just spinning faster and faster while people got sicker and sicker and had a longer and longer list of drugs to take. And I was just like, this is not going to work. Robin Burzen started down what looked like a successful career path at the U.S. Attorney's Office, but she was unfulfilled in the actual day-to-day work, and she realized that she wanted to help people rather than prosecute them. And that, combined with memories of her grandmother's battle with preventable cancer, led Robin to pivot to a path that would help to revolutionize how we think about healthcare. Let's listen in. I soul searched a bunch because I sat there and I was working at the U.S. Attorney's Office, prosecuting securities fraud as, you know, on the paralegal level, supporting the prosecutors, really. And I knew I didn't really want to be doing that. That didn't feel right. It felt punitive, not helpful. And I wanted to be helpful. And so I sat down and I wrote down a lot, like, what do I want to spend my time doing? What do I like to do? Uh, I like to be on my feet. I like to help people. Um And then I thought, well, what did I like in college? Because I think a lot of us also, if you have the, I mean, it's such a privilege to be able to go to school, but then you go to school and you kind of barrel your way through and you're told you're sort of supposed to know what you already want to do. And you take all these classes and what are they about? And I thought back to my, well, some of my favorite classes and, and I realized that You know, I had taken this course on cancer, I think second year of school. And it was at a time when my grandmother had been dying of colon cancer and she had gotten colon cancer early in life through um, her history of smoking and diet, basically Um, that, you know, Hmm. 50% of all cancers are preventable. I learned in this course and she had developed colon cancer that way. And then she ultimately died of colon cancer early because she hadn't also gotten the proposed, the right preventive screening, hadn't gotten colonoscopy early enough. And in that class, I think I took that class because she was sick at the time. It was sort of outside of the scope of, you know, whatever it was I thought I was supposed to be focusing on at the time. And when I looked back at school and I remember taking that class and writing a paper on a holistic approaches to cancer therapy that had won an award at school at that time and kind of dug into other things I was interested in. I think I sort of started to say, ah, I'm interested in health and I like doing medical research bizarrely. And I like understanding the biology of these disease processes and I'm interested in public health. And so it took me a beat to tease those things out, but between yoga and those memories, it started to feel like a clue and a pattern. And so I pursued that into switching jobs into a psych research job at NYU School of Medicine, where I wasn't so sure I was interested in psych. And I ultimately did not you know, go into psych. I trained in internal medicine, but I got some experience with patients and I got some experience in a medical hospital setting and I got some experience in healthcare in that job. And that was enough for me to say, okay, yeah, <laughs> like this makes sense. I want to do this. So I think it was a matter of listening to myself trying something, being willing to fail, like be knowing that maybe I would have taken that job at NYU and I don't know, hated it and not said, no, this isn't for me either. But it was the process of, is this right? Is this right? Is this right? And then just trying to follow my heart. Speaking of experience, uh, can you share the story of how you started working with Dr. Ask? I just, I just love that story. (laughs) Yes. So For those of you listening, I was the first producer for Dr. Oz's first radio show before he had a TV show. So in these days, he was mostly a cardiac surgeon at Columbia. It was like his main job. And then at the time, he was writing some of his first bestsellers, and he was on Oprah, the Oprah show, best show ever on television as far as I'm concerned. Um, he was on the Oprah show many times a year at this point, but he wasn't sort of famous the way that he, he later became. And he was going to do a radio show with Oprah. And I was 
back in my undergrad, my fifth year of college, taking bio and orgo and physics and all the courses I hadn't taken because I hadn't been pre-med in undergrad originally. So I had to go back and do all that, which is a total pain. But I was doing that and I needed a job and I wanted to be back in New York. So I saw, I was researching who is doing integrative medicine research and who is doing really good, cool kinds of public health research and interesting research at Columbia. Maybe I can get a research job. Had no idea who he was, looked up his email address (laughs) on Columbia's website um, and sent him a cold email and attached my resume at the last second and said, you know, because he had gone to Penn, I think for med school and I was there for undergrad and post back. And so I said, Hey, I went to your same school and I'm smart, I guess. And, you know, I need a job um, in healthcare. And I've already done psych research. I've already done some research at NYU. So um, he called me <laughs> and told me he was going to start this radio show uh, and working with Oprah. And my dad who's a doctor is like, who is this person? Is this like a real person? And I was like, I think so. I'm looking him up. I'm like, he has all these degrees. Seems like he's a surgeon. Seems neat. Um <laughs> Uh, so I took the job and, uh, it was awesome. I learned so much there and I'm really grateful for the experience. <laughs> yeah. And, and you were volunteering, like you told them that that was your offers. I would love to just volunteer for you in whatever way I can help you. And it wasn't like you were asking for him for a paid job or anything like that, which I thought was really cool that you did that and it paid off. But he said something while you guys were working together that really stuck with you, which is about a bagel. <laughs> Yes. Dr. Oz was, we were doing practice recordings for the show. You know, at that time he had never hosted a radio show before. So he was learning and we were all learning how to do this. And we were in New York and the Oprah team were all remote in Chicago. It was like early days of remote work. These were like podcasts before podcast was a thing, by the way, that was like what this was. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we would never have used that word then, which is weird to think about now. And uh, we were doing a practice run, I think, on nutrition and talking about the insulin response to car- for, uh, refined carbohydrates. And he said, eating a bagel plain is like throwing a grenade in your stomach. And you'd be better off putting on some butter or some cream cheese or some sort of fat to slow down your insulin response to keep your blood sugar spikes lower. And I was like, <gasps> and I thought about the way I thought about nutrition for like literally my entire life. You know, everything we learned in the 80s and 90s, don't eat any fat, carbs are fine. Uh, and it threw all of that upside down and just made me realize, you know, here I am trying to go to med school. I wasn't in med school yet at this point trying to be in health. I know clearly nothing about health and what it is that I'm eating every day and how it's impacting my body. How on earth does anybody else know this too? Mm. Uh, And I was just so fascinated by all of the information that I got to learn from him. And, and really a lot of it came from reading the books of all the people who would be guests on the show. And so I would have to read all their books every week. I'd read five books a week. I'd summarize them. I'd do all the notes so that he, you know, he's a very busy man. He had to be sort of come in and ready to record these shows. And so that was my part of my job. And what an opportunity to read so much and learn, you know, as your part of your job. So it was, it was amazing. What were you most impressed with about, about that experience working with Dr. Oz? So many things. First of all, how many really smart, incredible scientists and physicians and public health leaders, like all the people who came on to that show as guests were like extraordinary people whom I got to meet Mm -hmm. Um, from Oprah herself and Gail King to all these people in the medical field who were trying to pull together information in a way that was salient and actionable and interesting. And, you know, I give Dr. Oz and Oprah so much credit because at that time, no one else had ever said, could health information be entertaining and interesting. This is like before the wellness movement. This is before all the blogs. This is before the podcasts. And no one had tried to say, how do we make health information something that anyone could have access to and own and use in their daily lives? And that was super cool. I learned so much. I learned so much about how to communicate, I think, health information in a way that's interesting and actionable, both from him and from Oprah, but also from, again, all the guests on the show. And so it's such an, such an amazing education, truly. 
Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. Okay. So let's cut to medical school. Now you have an aspiration to become a primary care physician, I believe. And you overheard, well, one of your surgeons made a comment. <laughs> one of your professors made a comment about why would anybody come to Columbia Medical School it would, in hopes of becoming a primary care physician? Because obviously, um, <laughs> those are the physicians that are least likely to be reimbursed by insurance companies, and it's not very lucrative and blah, blah, blah. So talk a little bit about your um, your motivation to become primary care physician and how you were able to sort of navigate that, that, that snobby attitude around, you know, doing something a little bit more specialized. You know, I was the daughter of a primary care physician. My dad was a pre-CP and I didn't think, I don't think I really understood when I went to med school that these different fields were valued so differently and that surgeons were considered these like gods and that Fields like ophthalmology and dermatology were paid these like huge sums of money uh, and everyone mm -hmm. would make fun of the people who wanted to go into those fields that they just wanted the like, you know, easy cash money fields. I just didn't know, you know, you know you're a kid, you're just going to school, you want to learn, you want to help people. Um, I didn't know that these fields, you know, fairly or unfairly in many cases, candidly, have, have, have these Sarah stereotypes, right? And we need all these fields. But I didn't understand that those biases were what they were. And so I'm in my third year, I guess, of medical school, which is the year that traditionally you spend, you know, five, six weeks in each specialty, internal medicine and OBGYN and surgery, and you're there to help. And then you're also there to learn what it's all about. And in a neurosurgery OR, the neurosurgeon's there and the skull is open and he's literally like dangling a tumor off of a forcep. And this sounds really grotesque, I'm sure if anyone's listening to this and I don't mean to be laughing, but if you think about the absurdity of the moment, that's, that's why I'm, I'm smiling. Cause it was just sort of as students, you're just standing there with your eyes wide open, like can't believe what you're seeing. Also can't believe you're just sort of having a conversation with this person as they're, you know, going through this procedure. It's sort of amazing. And uh, he asked each of us what we wanted to go into. And one of the other women in my student group said primary care. And he said, uh, why would you want to do that? That's such a waste of a spot at Columbia. And so I quickly changed my answer. <laughs> I can't remember what I said. I think I said I wasn't sure yet. But uh, I think that in, in that moment was a realization and an important one, not just of some of the sort of stereotypes in medicine, but also just how we as an or as a country have valued the most important part of medicine, which is our primary care um, field, which is there to really be the one that knows us and takes care of us. And yet it's paid the least and sort of taken the least seriously. And that really doesn't make sense when you think about a country where we talk a lot about rising healthcare costs and chronic disease is exploding. Uh, we have it sort of backwards. And so it was a big wake up call. Okay. So can we talk a little bit about the early pre parsley days of you as a practicing doctor? Talk about the business of medicine. Like, you know, a lot of these appointments only last for 10 or 15 minutes and a lot of prescriptions are getting prescribed. Like what's going on behind the scenes that the patient would not know about that is ultimately unsustainable for everybody's highest and best good. So, you know, when I was in my training at Columbia, Mount Sinai, amazing places here in New York, um, and especially in our outpatient clinic. So a, lot, well, a bunch of the training you do is in the hospital where people are already, you know, admitted for very serious conditions. And then a bunch of it's outpatient where, you know, you think of like you and me going to the doctor. Um, and most mm -hmm. patient care in our country is happening outpatient, right? It's happening in clinics. It's not the majority isn't happening in hospitals. But uh, in those clinics, I remember I had 15 minute visits with a patient and those visits were so rushed. You were trying to do so much. 
in those visits and you do this like quick, basic physical exam and you figure out all the stuff that's going on and everything that's happened since the last time they were saw you and all the specialists they saw and the procedures that they had and what drugs are they taking? And are they actually taking those medications? I mean, it was like, it, it felt like a, just a race to the finish line. And I would spend two of those 15 minutes, like two of those very precious 15 minutes printing out prescriptions four to a page and handing somebody a stack of two, three, four, sometimes five pages of prescriptions, four to a page for drugs and referrals to specialists. And the data said that 50% of drugs are never even filled at the pharmacy. No one even picks them up. And the specialist visits would take months to get to and result in another procedure and maybe an added another drug. And then they'd be on back to me. And I saw that all the things I was writing prescriptions and referrals for, high blood sugar, high blood pressure, migraine headaches, joint pain, autoimmune conditions, infertility, anxiety and depression, gastrointestinal issues, hormone stuff, all of it. The things that everyone is living with for day, years and maybe decades, all of us that these conditions were highly interrelated to each other. They were highly multifactorial. They were very dependent on what we were eating and how we were moving and how we were managing stress. And yet there was no place on my prescription pad for food in any serious way or for movement or for meditation or for um, any of the things that were the root cause drivers of some of these conditions let alone did I have you know, nowhere near enough time with a patient to ever address those things. And so what I saw was that we'd created a revolving door between primary care and specialists that was just spinning faster and faster and faster while people got sicker and sicker and had a longer and longer and longer list of drugs to take. And I was just like, gosh, this is not going to work. Like this, this is not working. And so that really inspired me to say, what would a system look like that fixed a lot of this if we were to sort of start fresh, start anew, start outside the system, be a little bit radical in the way that we want to approach it and do something totally different. And that was um, a huge learning. Look, I'm sure you're not the first physician to think about this, what, what, what do you think made you take those next steps to actually start this platform? I mean, what, why you? Well, is it your exposure to Dr. Oz? Or did you have some kind of tech relationships <laughs> or? Well, you know, what's that saying? If not me. Was it the yoga? Was it the Vipassana <laughs> course? I think it was all those things. I think it was back to, you know, knowing about functional medicine from Dr. Mark Hyman, who I met when I worked for Dr. Oz and had sent me the Institute mm. for Functional Medicine's textbook. And so I knew that there was another way of practicing medicine that was effective, that existed, right? It might not have been widely available, but it did exist. Um, <laughs> uh, it was, I had started another company in end of the school and early part of my residency with a friend from medical school. And in the tech space in healthcare. Um, he went on to run that company for a long time. It's still out there. Um, and we built a, a, a piece of software to help better coordinate care in hospitals. But the experience of starting that company in medical school, I think, you know, meeting my co-founder and he had had two companies before medical school. So I was exposed to someone who said, Hey, I, I've started companies. I was like, all right, there's not a lot of this, but it is possible. It exists, right? You can start something from nothing. And so I'd had a little bit of experience by the time I started Parsley of what it was like to get a company off the ground from literally idea in your head to forming a company, forming an organization, you know, building a product, raising a little bit of money. I had seen that, not very much, right? Like let's, I just, I was in that company for a, a little while, but um, I'd seen it and had some exposure and so I think it was those things coupled with my passion for seeing that this care had to be better and thinking back to my grandmother, how, yes, it would have been way better if she had gotten a colonoscopy on time, which is a life-saving screening intervention, not or, but and, and so she needed better primary care than she had had. However, and 
she needed functional medicine to change the way she ate and lived so that she didn't get colon cancer in the first place. And so it was just this combination of having this light bulb moment, seeing the forest for the trees, thinking about what could be possible and enough exposure to people and, and places who said, Hey, let's do this a different way. I mean, you know, even the radio show that we did with Dr. Oz and, and Harpo or Oprah's production company was, um, the startup in and of itself, it was something that had never existed before that we, I was in the first year of getting off the ground. So, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know, all those things came together. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.